I can get rid of it. Are you going to leave that? Yeah. Okay. Let me just. Okay. We're going to get started. You said the hairs is live right now. Um, I think you like most everybody is here, so just kick off, right? Sure, I'm. All right, good morning, good morning to everybody. It's so good to see you all after two years of us being stuck inside. So we do just want to welcome you today um, and thank you for joining us as we launch part three of Rural Talks on the Hill series. Uh, today, the talk is all about workforce and small business. 
and we are so pleased that you could join us both virtually and in person. My name is Justin Birch, and I'm the National Director for Rural LISC of Workforce Development and Small Business. And joining me on stage is Emily Avery. I'll assume that clap was for me and not him, so thank you. Uh, my name is Emily Avery. I'm the Director of Alignment and the Rural Financial Opportunity Center across the country in rural communities. Um, which we have a lot of FOCs representing today. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, we have an incredible day planned for you and really want to acknowledge not only our sponsors that have helped make these last three seminars this year happen, but also everyone at the hotel, our IT staff. We have just had an incredible support team that's really helped put this on. Um, our rural list staff, who has been absolutely incredible again after three events. I'll probably say that about 10 more times, just so you all know how hard we've been working to bring these to you. Um, and then also all of you for making the trip and being here. So thank you so much for um, the support. We hope that you all learned so much today. Um, I did just want to acknowledge the fact that we kicked off our event last night. For those of you who are in person, um, I we had a little networking event for you and um, you all participated as you always do, which was really incredible. Um, and just wanted to acknowledge some of the really great um, best practices and innovative solutions that you all brought up. Um, so we went through some of the post-it notes last night and um, heard some really incredible um, ideas around business advisory councils, how you can really bring capital to small businesses, um, bringing new um, technical assistance and resources to small businesses in your area and just um, a lot of regional ideas. Um, and probably the theme that I heard most that I hope will carry throughout this conference is that um, you're really finding solutions that work for those small businesses and those individuals who are in the workforce and bringing them right to them instead of trying to find solutions that work for um, the employer. So again, I think you'll hear that theme throughout and um, I'll hand it back over to Justin to talk a little bit about the agenda. All right, so we have some pretty incredible country cousins who are gonna be joining us over the next two days. Today we'll mainly focus on workforce and tomorrow we'll mainly focus on small business, but we have everyone from incredible community trust organizations who are doing awesome work on the ground. You'll hear from USDA, you'll hear from IDC, MDBA, all the acronym soup that you can imagine in DC will be with us. So we're really looking forward to that. And please stay tuned for tonight for an announcement along with our awardees um, for the evening. For those of you who are in the room, the agenda can be found using the QR code on your name badges and on the table. And a couple of housekeeping um, items. We do have face masks as well as COVID tests available if anyone at any time would like those. So if you feel the need, find Emily, find me, Julianne in the back. Julianne, do you want to wave your hand? Also, you should all know that today is really brought to you by Julianne. Um, she's done a lot of incredible work to bring us uh, here this week. So we'll just acknowledge her. Emily? Um, so my talking points are now reminding me to share with you all um, to use the hashtag rural list to make sure everybody knows that you are here and to share some of the really great experiences and lessons that um, you're learning throughout. For those of you who are joining us virtually, thank you um, for being here. We have a huge group joining us virtually. Um, please feel free to engage in the chat boxes that we have. We have lots of lounges that you can chat with your colleagues on different topics. So please take advantage of those. Um, and I, we hope that you'll engage in that, that question and answer um, session that we have. Now to officially kick off this morning, I have the honor of inviting um, our LISC Vice President and Ruralist Director, Caitlin Kane, and LISC CEO, Lisa Glover, to set the table for what will be an interesting and insightful seminar. Wow, that's a lot of silence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good morning, morning everyone. Oh, who's excited to be at the third and final seminar series of Rule Talks on the Hill? 
This is it, going into 2023. Thank you all so much for being here with us this morning. Thank you, Emily and Justin, for kicking us off this morning. And it is my absolute pleasure to be sitting next to our LISC CEO, Lisa Glover. Lisa is no stranger to community development and rural investment. She actually has served as the executive vice president for US Bank for over 30 years, served on the, the board of LISC and also on the Milwaukee Advisory Committee. So uh, a huge supporter and fan of community development of LISC and is just so excited to have you here today to talk to about here. rural investment. Um, I know that you also come from a uh, rural community. I come from the heart of Iowa. Yes. yes yeah. Mm -hmm. I also grew up in a uh, rural community in upstate New York and also in the, the New England area. So just absolute, uh, ex really excited to be talking about rural investment with you today. I have uh, a series of seven questions or so that I would love to ask you. Well, I have and... a series of seven answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Can't wait to get into that. Yes. Uh, and then I definitely want to be able to open this up to have a very casual dialogue with some members of uh, our audience today. But before we launch directly into the questions, I just want to take a, a few minutes to really kind of set the table about why we're really here today to talk about workforce and small business investment, two key themes that are just so important to rural communities. We know, it, you know, having grown up in, in rural communities that urban and rural communities and economies are inherently different, right? We have some significant challenges and opportunities in rural America. We, coming from rural communities, we love the lifestyle of, of rural in general, the sensibility of rural, the, 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 the really the, the rural culture that really resonates and is so much of uh, Americana and, and global. But we have some significant challenges, you know, especially as it relates to workforce and, and small business investment, capital access, we know that regional employers in, in rural America are challenged when it comes to attracting and also retaining workforce, qualified workers with the necessary skills, credentials, and schooling to really be successful and to retain that quality job in, in a regional marketplace. We also know on top of that, that many rural communities also struggle in terms of individual financial assistance, access to a variety of different services. In rural America, you know, we spend over 30% of our income on housing and over 50% of our census tracts are significantly challenged when it comes to childcare, transportation options, and immediate access to high-speed broadband, a significant divide in our communities. But having said all of that, there are so many opportunities for rural America, and LISC has been at the forefront of really doing investment in these communities for over 25 years. And kind of given that, launching into the very first question is why do you believe community investment is so important and why should the rule of voice really matter at the local and national level? Well, thanks, Caitlin. So the first thing I want to say is not only did I grow up in rural Iowa, uh, my first job was walking beans. If anybody's old enough to remember when they used to actually walk the beans, I can see people out there. Um, I still live in rural America. So I live in a small town in Wisconsin now. Uh, where it's Wisconsin, we don't have a bank, we don't have a grocery store, I have to drive to the next town to get to eat both of those things. Being Wisconsin, we do have three bars and a drive through liquor store. But uh, other than Important that, things. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite remote. So I completely understand. And you know, yesterday, uh, my husband had to go over to a friend's house because their internet connectivity is not fast. They're still doing the buffering thing on a daily basis and trying to get somebody out there to help them get connectivity was, you know, took an act of God uh, in a rural community. So I'm living this type of stuff as well as talking about it. So the rural voice uh, is, is really, really important. Um, let's just talk a little bit about what's happened in rural communities, you know, over the past decades, right? I firmly believe that rural communities are the heart of this country. They're what keeps this country going. Um, sometimes they're referred to in a more positive way. Maybe they're the breadbasket. Other times it's a more negative, uh, the flyover states, hate that one. Um, but rural communities have been an important part of this country since it was founded. Uh, we were a rural country, that's what we were. And for the past, I don't know, 100 years or so, we've seen dwindling interest in supporting and uh, 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 working in rural communities um, and the support and investment has dwindled. 
we've seen that. So ways of life that used to be part of the fabric of our nation, the family farm, my family farm is gone, family farm, fishing industry, dairy industry, you just can't make a living doing that as a family anymore. And, and that's kind of sad, but it does have implications for our culture and it has implications for our identity um, as the United States. So I think we all need to wake up and smell the coffee, right? Uh, we need to start investing. We need to refocus on rural issues uh, to make sure that our rural areas thrive and survive. We, uh, that's what's best for our country. We can't do it without rural America. We've been extracting resources from our rural communities, extracting talent. Um, I know for myself, uh, you know, growing up in Boone, Iowa, I, uh, my dad had a business. You know, we were a, a nice middle-class family as I grew up. Uh, when he got ready to retire and sell the business, my husband and I said, we'll take over the business, we'll do this. And he said, no. No, we're not going to do, he said, the, the, the businesses are dying. Um, there's not going to be a business. You'll not be able to make, make a living doing this. And he was right. You know, I drive through my down, the downtown of my hometown, and it is all empty storefronts at this point in time. Um, so we've been extracting the talent. We've been extracting resources, but we haven't been reinvesting back really. We haven't been putting that money back in. Um, you know, 20% of the population lives in rural America, about five to 7% of the philanthropic dollars go there. So that's not a balance. And that's a balance that we need to, to change. And we also have to think about just like in urban areas, all of this has disproportionately affected BIPOC communities, low and moderate income communities, indigenous communities. So these are all things that we need to think about. That's why I think the rural voice, especially right now, is so important at all levels of government. Well, you, you hit on all of those right themes, right? I mean, so much of what we've been talking about over the last few years is especially that extractive nature of how we treat rural communities and not reinvesting back in, in, really into our communities in a variety of different ways, especially when it comes to access to capital. Mm -hmm. Loved hearing your story about really wanting to stay in a rural community, really wanting to take over the family business, mm -hmm. but didn't really have the resources, the means to do that. And so can you, let's, let's lean into that a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about how is LISC really stepping up to help more of these rural communities from an access to capital perspective? How can we really assist or what do you really think is needed when it comes to investments in these communities? When we think about the family farms, when we think about the, the main street type small businesses, the types of capital that could really go the distance to, to help to revitalize some of these yeah, areas. True. So let's talk first about some of the reasons why capital is a challenge. Okay. So I came, as, as Caitlin said, 33 years as a banker. Um, so I understand both sides of the table. I understand where we're coming from. We know that a lot of investment in our low and moderate income communities comes from financial institutions complying with the Community Reinvestment Act, with CRA. And that's great. It's great for low and moderate income communities. But it's, uh, it's hard to get those investments from large financial institutions in uh, rural communities. It's hard because you know, the, the dollars and the impact of, of number of people are important when the examiners come in and take a look at how you're doing and you just don't get as, as, as dense of a bang for your buck. So that's why we see less investment um, in the rural communities. And I do applaud all of the, the financial institutions that do understand that and try to uh, make those investments. But there's a lot of rural communities. It's not just one targeted area. It's all over the country. Um, so, and as I said before, there's even fewer philanthropic dollars that are going there. Um, it's also important to note um, that, you know, commercial banks, the brick and mortar commercial banks are closing in rural areas. And I understand that too. Brick and mortar is very expensive, especially especially in you know in the last two years, no one would walk into a bank. I don't have a bank within ten miles of me. I I have to think about where the nearest bank is because I do everything online. But um, it's there. So rural communities, either people that are in small business or in farming or whatever they're in, they either have to drive a long distance to get to a bank to access capital, or they have to utilize the online banking services that are out there. Now there's great online banking services out there, but what do you need for online banking services? First of all, you need your internet connection. You need to be able to get to them. 
and you need to understand how to use them. It's not just a slam dunk um, to get out there and do it. I, I don't know if anybody's ever like tried to apply for a mortgage online, but I, I'm a banker and I help design the website at my bank and I still get lost in it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing. We need to have digital skilling in order to enable our real uh, small businesses and communities to access that. So that is where I think CDFIs can come into the picture. So LISC is working in several ways. We're working on digital skilling um, and online accessibility um, across rural countries, or countries, across <laughs> rural communities. Ooh, it's early. I haven't had enough coffee yet. That's what's happening to me. Um, so the digital navigator cohorts that mm -hmm. have been deployed are working on that. Could we do more? Yes, but it's a start. It's something to do. We're also investing capital itself in small businesses, um, rural-based businesses. We're providing small business grants. We're providing small loans. And most importantly, which we'll talk about, I know, is technical assistance that we're providing. Um, and we know that uh, rural businesses really need a specialized type of technical assistance. It's a, it's a different world than an urban environment. So we're investing in um, building the capacity of technical assistance providers that can specialize um, in rural businesses, especially since rural businesses are different in different parts of the country. Um, actually, I think rural is, I think you have 42 BDOs across the country. Correct. So we are working very broad, broadly yep. across to build this gap. And then uh, we also deploy Kiva, the micro lending platform, um, it's focused both on small micro loans and TA. Um, and we have 11 Kiva trustees um, in the rural network across the country. So the sport looks way different than it does in an urban community. Um, and it should. And I think that's because LISC and CDFIs, we need to meet our rural communities where they are, not where we think they should be. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's excellent. And, you know, when we were talking about just the really kind of the, the shuttering down of commercial banking establishments in rural communities, which so many of us have experienced in our respective communities, it changes the network, right? It changes your ability to one, to access capital, but also your, your network for all of those that are capital providers. And, and that is a, an, an additional hindrance to so many of our rural-based businesses. And then when we think about technical assistance, it kind of grows, right? So technical assistance goes from everything from digital skilling to then also how do we help our businesses get back that access to a network, which is so important when we're, we're trying to reestablish and gain flexible capital. Given that and given the role that LISC has had over the last 25, 26 years in this space, what do you think more CDFIs need to do to kind of lean in to technical assistance. Where do you see it trending over the next five to, to eight years in terms of opportunities for additional assistance? And what do you think it's really gonna go the distance for some of these communities? Well, you know, I think that we know that, that rural communities, um, especially those that have persistent poverty, they really lack capacity support organizations in the communities. There's not, I mean, there are CDC, uh, CDCs and there's, CDFIs and there's nonprofit partners in rural communities, but they're not as dense and they're not in every rural community. And I think those are really the key to providing supports to our rural communities. So we at, um, as the CDFI, as LISC, we really need to help organizations uh, establish a footprint in rural America. We need to help them build their own capacity we have to um, help them help the people in their communities. I think that it's really, really important to have that local touch. You know, we can't do it from New York City. We can't do it from Washington, DC, but you can do it in Kansasville, Wisconsin, or you can do it in Boone, Iowa, okay? So I think it's really important for us to focus on capacity building um, for support organizations that are in rural towns. but it takes money to support these programs. We know that. So again, the rub 
is getting that investment into rural communities. Mm -hmm. And we've got to, we've got to crack that nut. We've got to figure that out. And let's talk about that, right? Mm -hmm. So we, in our audience, we have a, a lot of representatives from both public and, and private agencies and corporate foundations. And kind of given everything that we've been chatting about in terms of the need for technical assistance, where do you think philanthropy really needs to lean in? you know, especially over the next five to eight years, and especially coming out of COVID and what we've seen in terms of significant divides economically, socioeconomically, where can corporate philanthropy and public philanthropy really have an opportunity to make a difference? Well, you know, I, I think that we have to recognize that the skills needed to be in the workforce are changing, right? You can't be a farmer, you can't be a plumber, without having digital skills today. And that's something that's changed rapidly, maybe in the last 10 years, maybe even the last five years, I don't know. So we need to ensure that we are layering digital skilling in our workforce, and we're also layering it into our entrepreneurs, into the small business support system. Everybody needs to have that. So broadband access, again, our digital skilling are really Key important, uh, key important strategies um, for the rural areas. We have to really lean into those, and I think that's a great spot for lenders or for uh, funders to to lean into. I think that that's where we can really make uh, the most impact. Mm -hmm. Is uh, we don't need to have we don't need to bring brick and mortar into these communities if we can get people connected digitally. We can really make a difference. Um, but we have to manage the expectations of funders. Um, and I understand that funders really need to see impact. That's what they want to see. But these types of investments, they take a little bit longer. They may be a little more risky. They look different. Um, they're not impacting, you know, dense populations. They're, it's a disparate population that are dispersed. Um, but you have to just understand and embrace that, that it takes every little bit to connect everyone in. So it can have a transformational impact, I think, on rural and remote areas, but we need to be talking in a different way to our funders that they need to be patient, that they need to be flexible, and that they need to embrace the cultural nuances that are out there. And I think that this is particularly true in uh, some of the very, very low income areas in the Deep South, uh, in some of our indigenous communities. Um, these are ignored populations for the most part. They have incredible, incredible need um, and we need to embrace them. So, you know, I think engaging in bringing more technical assistance and bringing more capacity to the communities, um, teaching people how to access flexible capital, teaching people how to to uh, stack capital or assisting, them, assisting with them in, in stacking capital, um, assisting them in things like organizational management. How do you manage an organization as it grows? I think those are all important things, but we need funders to flex with us. Mm -hmm. Incredibly important when you think, especially for rural investment, the, the, the pennies on the dollar really that, mm -hmm. that go to rural communities philanthropically compared to the urban counterparts. So really important to, to think about layering and leverage for our, our rural areas. Um, you had mentioned a little bit about that the, the individual, right? So I want to take the conversation back from talking about more communities at large to really LISC's involvement with individual and individual wealth creation. And LISC has really been at the forefront of really investing in an individual, getting an individual stable, meeting an individual where they're at through a variety mm -hmm. of different ways to help that person obtain a better quality of life, a better job, really try to move that, again, that socioeconomic needle. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of the, the LISC resources and what LISC has brought to bear in many of these communities and how, that's, how that has traditionally played out over the last 10 years? And where are we going in the next you know, eight to 10 years from this? Where, where do we see, how do we have to evolve with the needs of the individual? Sure, sure. So LISC obviously has had for, for many, many years, uh, programs out there like our financial opportunity centers, the FOCs. Um, I can remember when they launched, um, and you know now we have a huge network of FOCs. We also have our Bridges to Opportunity uh, program, where Bridges um, is designed to work with specific employers who have a need, and then provide the workplace or workforce uh, training to match those needs, so we can bring businesses and um, employees together. 
Uh, and we also see the FOC model um, in our rural America, um, in the rural program, we have that here. Um, I think I see it evolving to more than just uh, family wealth building and financial wellness. We really need to expand it to workforce training, um, I think uh, more deeply and digital skilling as we've mm -hmm. talked about more deeply. I, I can see us starting to um, evolve into some of those types of things. And I know Rural Works is, uh, is directly aiming to provide sh some short-term credentialing for employees and some apprenticeship opportunities as well out there. So those are great things that we're doing. Um, you know, Rural LISC, I think, is working too with regional employers to try to find a match and fill the gaps that are out there in workforce as well. So I think that's great. But we know that rural areas suffer from high unemployment, higher unemployment than we are right now. They uh, have lower workforce participation. We have a lot of people that just don't participate in the workforce. They have lower education levels. Um, so, you know, we need to really work with these communities to identify those workforce gaps and then find unique and innovative ways to fill those gaps. I think that's the best thing for us to do. So if I could sum that up, we really need a system. We need a systems-based approach to solving this. Um, and I know that Ruralisk is working very, very hard on that, but you know, we, we need to step it up a notch and, and look at the whole system. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad you had mentioned that um, coming as a, as a former banker, right? Mm -hmm. A key anchor establishment within that system is often the banking community, mm -hmm. right? Especially in many of our rural communities where we do have, you know, retail banks uh, present. They're a huge investor and really, you know, they're part of the, the community brain trust. And Given that and our, our need to really think a little bit more profoundly about how do we creatively address workforce solutions and how do more CDFIs really step up and, and play in this space, where do you see the, the bank's role in, in workforce development from kind of the, the, the banking perspective as we're kind of really leaning in more to economic development investment opportunities, particularly from local and regional banks? Right. I, you know, I do think that local and regional banks need to think about, uh, you know, they're, they're very engaged with not only small businesses, um, but larger businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses, and they have needs for workforce as well. And they want those businesses to thrive. So it's in their best interest to look for uh, investment in organizations that are, that are providing workforce training, skilling people up for specific jobs um, so that they can keep those industries in their communities, so that they can grow those industries, um, whether it's a small business or a business that employs 300, 500, 3,000 people. So I, I, you know, I think the key is that, that banks, and I'm certain that financial institutions realize this, but it's in their best interest to ensure that there's a robust uh, workforce in any given community uh, that's trained and that the jobs that they're being offered are quality jobs, quality jobs that you know, are paying a living wage and um, are paying more than a living wage and are providing health benefits. And equally important too, right, to ensure that these banks are participating in, in regional planning efforts, right? When we're thinking Absolutely. about this, going back to your earlier point of really needing to think about a systems approach and ensuring that all these various stakeholder groups are part of that sort of systems planning, banks are a critical component of that mm -hmm. and offer a, a great perspective, investment opportunities along the way. Um, so this brings us to our, one of the final questions that I have before I really want to open it up to other questions from the audience. but uh, you know, as a leader of one of the country's largest CDFIs, you're in a unique position. You're, you're in the catbird seat of, of really being able to see what's going on programmatically, monitor trends, and really help to guide investments where they can be most impactful. So given this, what do you think that the collective we needs to be thinking about when we're, when we're trying to think about how do we scale solutions for workforce investment? And how do we scale solutions for really micro level capital access opportunities in mm -hmm. our rural communities? And then thirdly on that, 
What do you think is the big idea, especially for funders, whether you're public or private, what sort of big ideas that do we really need to be considering and how can we help our, our funding community kind of really lean in to these opportunities? The big idea, boy, I, I, I don't know if I have the big idea, but I do know that we need to have a holistic approach. We have a lot of different programs that we're building. Uh, we build the resiliency of small businesses by building the capacity of, of T, uh, TA providers and business development organizations. And that's critical. That's a critical piece of what we do. Um, those small businesses that we've talked about, um, they need a specialized workforce. And we're involved in finding ways to train up workforce for them to make that connection. But we also, and you kind of alluded to this, we also need strong community networks, okay? So we need main streets that are thriving. So going back to my example of growing up in Iowa, and my dad was a, was a businessman, right? And, you know, Stan Redeker was the furniture guy and everybody bought their furniture there. And Regis Duffy had the appliance store and everybody bought that. And Bob Hamilton had the the uh, 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 hardware store, and we all went to Hamilton's Hardware for everything, right? And one by one, they all fell. And I'm not suggesting that we're ever going to get back to that, but we do need to get back to some networks because one of the components of having a small business thrive in a rural community is having other small businesses around it. And our small businesses look different now, right? Uh, it may be a smoothie shop and a yoga studio um, instead of the hardware store and the appliance store, but still it's a network. So, you know, if, if I were to say one thing that I think that we, we need to be thinking about is not only the individual business and the individual workers and the workforce, but that network of businesses and somehow uh, be innovative um, and creative and how we bring together that whole ecosystem. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great response. And I think, it, again, it kind of goes back to the need to pair that place-based strategy with an ecosystem approach, right? Mm -hmm. Really bringing in the regional employers, bringing in, uh, you know, your two-year, your your WIOs, all of that is part of a conversation in terms of workforce development, but ensuring that that investment is also going down to the, to the heart of Main Street America for our rural communities. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a great response, and I think it, it really hits on a number of the other programs that so many of us in the room work on, whether it's helping to revitalize the downtown through a Main Street program, working on workforce investment initiatives in a variety of different contexts, uh, whether we're with a our two-year or four-year university or um, working on apprenticeships with regional employers, and then also just on the small business side, there's so much of the work that we do is really focusing on ensuring that we're getting capital, uh, very flexible capital immediately deployed out to many of our businesses to, to help with these re revitalization efforts. We've seen the significance of that, especially coming out of COVID, where we, you know, a lot of them were on the cusp of losing quite a few of those businesses. And so ensuring that we can rapidly deploy capital to these businesses at, especially in times of crisis is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. One area that we didn't talk a lot about, um, and I would love to chat about this a little bit more before, uh, after I open up to questions from the rest of the audience, which is also disaster, right? So mm -hmm. we, 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 we need to talk about climate change. Mm -hmm. The climate change has a huge significance on so much of the work that we do in our rural communities because we know rural communities are disproportionately impacted by accelerating climatic activity. And it is very difficult for so many of our communities to come back after a natural disaster. Um, so there's a ton we can talk about that. I would love to hear your insights and I, I don't want to monopolize all the time. So um, why don't I just open it up for a little so Q and A from the audience, see if there's some additional questions that all of you would like to ask of our CEO. Somebody chugged some coffee and get some energy out. <laughs> I know you're not a quiet group. You, you talked about uh, rural communities and the lack of philanthropic, philanthropic support, you know, the five to seven percent that come into uh, rural versus the 20 percent population. And that's that's been a standard figure for many, many years. Uh, as I look at the philanthropy community today, I'm noting that many of the, the philanthropic dollars 
are now located in private foundations or private uh, donor activated accounts with Vanguard or with various other, uh, you know, uh, national uh, uh, type uh, structures. How do we access many of those private foundations that we're, where the majority of the dollars are, are available today? And, and they're hidden. They're not, they're not your public foundation that, that is out there and is, is uh, you know, has to report and has to, has to follow certain rules. How, how do we access those particular dollars? And then how do rural communities access those dollars? Because there may be donors in those rural communities. We just don't know who they are. And many of them might have been the previous entrepreneurs yeah. that have sold their businesses. Absolutely. And that now they might have a special affinity if we can organize and enable. I think that's an excellent question. So first of all, how do we, how do we access those dollars? Uh, as soon as I figure it out, I'll send you an email and let you know. <laughs> Uh, but that is, you know, that's that's a tough nut to crack, and we're working on that. We are working on that structure, that strategy at LISC, because I can tell you, um, we realize that's where there's a lot of hidden wealth as well, and a lot of people who are who really, if they knew what they could be doing with that wealth, we think we could engage them. So that's number one. We've we, we've got to find them, and we're working on strategies to find them. The second one is to um, change our narrative. We need to, to think about how we talk about uh, the, the, uh, the low and moderate income community to include uh, talking about rural mm -hmm. America. We oftentimes, you know, it's very easy for us to talk about New York City or Los Angeles, but we need to really include in the conversation, not as a, and we do rural, we need to lead with rural um, in many cases, instead of having it be the also ran. And we would also like some funding for rural over here. Um, I agree with you 100% that it's the former entrepreneurs in small towns that have the money. It's the farmer that sold his, you know, thousand acres, and now he's a multimillionaire, um, and you know, is is sitting is sitting somewhere, and you know, what's he going to do with that money? Um, I know several of those myself. I think that's the importance of getting people on the ground in the communities. They know who those people are. Uh, we don't, but if we can build the capacity of the people that know if we can teach them, you know, what the narrative should be, how we should be building these ecosystems, how we should be helping people, they know who to go to. They know that, you know, that, that Joe Geppinger down the street um, has, has a lot of money and he sold his farm and he would be willing to, to invest in his community if he only knew how to do it. So I think the key, especially in rural America, is getting people who are familiar with the communities we're talking about, very engaged and building their capacity. And underscore, underscore, right? That need for a rural investment strategy at that state mm -hmm. level. And that is what I think really helps to one, amplify the, the need for an additional rural investment approach as part of a broader economic development plan, whether that's regional or statewide, and the alignment of resources, right? When we're thinking about rural investment, having that sort of state level strategy that has a specific rural lens that allows us to really kind of drill down on these sort of funding opportunities and alignment of those funders for in infrastructure investments all the way to housing uh, and broader community development opportunities. But absolutely couldn't agree with you more. Any other questions? Yep, here it comes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Jackson, uh, Delta Community Development Law Center, a former Lisker. Okay. So uh, I always appreciate coming to these. It's kind of like a family reunion. Welcome back. <laughs> so a um, couple of comments. I'm not sure I really have a question here. A couple of comments, maybe an invitation. What I haven't heard, and it's probably a part of your plan, is what is LIS doing about uh, using broadband to create economic development, even for very small businesses. What I think has happened with broadband is that uh, the internet has changed the concept of proximity altogether. 
Every time I order ink for uh, for one of my printers, it's it's not at the local office depot. It's the company in California that has figured out a way to sell milliliters of ink enough so that they can stay in business and probably make a profit. So I think that one of the things we need to do, in addition to just uh, technology skills, is help or create some mechanism for figuring out how do we take the change in proximity and kind of monetize it so that even you know families can make money and make a living for that. Hey. Uh, second thing, pardon me. Okay. I just, a lot of respect for this guy I didn't see him first. Second thing is this. I think it's good to talk about how we're going to uh, make capital more available. But I think we should take a special interest in reaching, uh, I'm going to say African-American communities, but also all minority communities. I hate the term BIPOC. I hope you never hear me say it again. Uh, I think it's troublesome because it kind of lumps all the needs together. But I think that if you're going to reach uh, African-American businesses, Native American businesses, you have to be very, very intentional. I serve on the New Market Support Company Advisory Committee, and I keep looking for ways that maybe that entity can be more intentional about how it reaches uh, smaller businesses and, minor, and rural businesses and uh, African-American businesses in particular. If we were going to do underwriting the traditional way, and we're just going to be nice people, Black-owned businesses will not be able to participate, okay? And a lot of minority businesses won't either. I love what you said about uh, uh, capacity building for technical assistance providers. Uh, Delta Community Development Law Center was formed to do that one thing, be a regional, highly skilled real estate development organization that could work with uh, organizations throughout the Delta areas of, uh, of Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Um, if any, any of your people want to have a discussion about that and how you can support what we're doing, this is my commercial. I'd love to have a talk with you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll let you go with the broadband. Okay, great. So uh, appreciate the, the, the conversation or the, the comment regarding broadband. So we are working on really trying to connect more of our small businesses to digital skilling opportunities and e-commerce platforms in a variety of different ways. This year, we actually, in partnership with Wells Fargo, just launched Rural Connect, which really gets to the heart of trying to address this, this division, right, between digital skilling, e-commerce uh, e platforms with small business, and the lack of access that many of our rural small businesses have to commercial banking establishments. So Rural Connect is all about providing digital skilling to small businesses and the broader demographic to skill up as it relates to fintech opportunities, online banking opportunities. And then what you know the benefit of working with an, an organization like LIST is it allows us to layer in our own programming through digital navigation and the deployment of resources and equipment. So by doing that, then we can connect these, these, op these organizations that we're working with to other opportunities that we have for investment. So the deployment of knowledge resources, the digital navigators that can help more of these communities directly connect to broadband opportunities, understand how to navigate broadband opportunities is one thing to connect. It's another thing to really have the skill set needed to take advantage of that, that level of connection. And then also understanding how to navigate online banking opportunities. So all that is part of it, along with micro lending opportunities to our small businesses. To your earlier point, having very flexible capital is incredibly important to our rural communities. What that capital deployment looks like is going to be very different in each of our rural communities, right? They're incredibly unique. They have different challenges. And so Rural Connect is a, the opportunity to really respond to that in a very comprehensive, holistic way. We also have the, the Verizon, digital, uh, Verizon Digital Program, which is really trying to help more of us rural-based small businesses get online and have online platforms so they can do and benefit from more e-commerce opportunities. The benefit of also doing that is to, you know, getting back to your early point that you raised before, with especially with farmers, especially with our big agricultural base and many of our rural communities, these are international type businesses too, right? There's a lot, there's a whole, whole economy out there that goes beyond our region. 
and really trying to help more of our small businesses get online and then be able to take advantage of all of these myriad resources that are out there to build and scale their operations, not just regionally, but also internationally. So that's kind of all part of this sort of comprehensive approach to our small business investment strategy. You know, I think I'll add to that too, is that, you know, you know, related to this, at LISC, we are trying to build some muscle with supplier diversity programs, right? And a lot of that is, is an e-commerce type of, uh, of platform working with, uh, and I hate the term BIPOC too, believe me, oh my gosh, uh, working with, you know, black owned businesses, with women owned businesses, with veterans owned businesses to try to break into um, some larger markets and be supplier uh, be suppliers for large corporations across the com uh, country, and uh, you know because a lot of corporations have certain goals for you know how many diverse suppliers they're going to use, and they don't have any idea how to get to the businesses. So we're trying to build some muscle around that so we can connect businesses, and that does not preclude rural businesses from participating in that, you know, because this is such a, like you said, the, the world has opened up, your marketplace is really the entire country, maybe the entire world, you know, that's another place where we can um, help make some connections to rural communities. Yeah. And sorry, there's one other in the corner. Do we have time for one more question? Yep, perfect. Right. Oh, one over here too. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Courtney Jeffries with Rural Lisk, and I'm asking a question on behalf of a virtual attendee. The question is, how do we best build rural community systems when so much of the government and philanthropic resources are categorical in nature? Well, we just... <laughs> It's, you know, it's, it's a great question, right? Because it's, uh, it's also a question not unique to the, the individual posing that. It's also a position that many of us in this room find ourselves in, right? It's responding to funder parameters out there, the creation of yet another program sometimes when what you need is more kind of flexible capital to deploy what you're already doing. Um, and I think that goes to the heart of the question that surfaced a little bit earlier in our conversation is about what are some of these big ideas for funders, uh, you know, whether you're on the public or on the private side, and how can you really lean in? And that's why I was so happy that, uh, you know, really underscore the need for capacity supports and technical assistance, because that is where we really need the most flexibility. Mm -hmm. And that flexibility in rural communities, you know, it's, it's long term in nature, it looks very different in each community. And it's getting funders comfortable with investing in entities to allow for that long-term investment that can meet the unique needs of that organization that aren't so prescriptive. And I think that's a conversation we need to continue to have with funders, especially as we continue to talk to funders about why they even just need to invest in rural, because oftentimes we're assuming that they're already there, they already want to make these rural investments, but we still have to amplify that, right? So there's a lot of advocacy still on the need for rural investment and why this is so important. So as we're championing that message, at the same time, we need to be able to wrap around this dialogue of, listen, yes, rural investment is incredibly important and it's gonna look a little different and it needs to be a little bit more flexible, a little bit longer term and to directly address some of these deep rooted issues that if you wanna have true transformation community in place, then we need to be much more flexible in the way that we think about the deployment of these funds. I agree. I have one more question, I think. Hello. Hello. <laughs> my name is uh, Carlos Ortega, and I want to, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Uh, Rural LISC has actually provided our organization, Elevate, with opportunities to support 17 small businesses and create opportunities um, in our rural community. And one of those, one of those, uh, the question that I have today is um, in part of the systems-based approach that you're uh, working towards, I haven't heard anything about succession planning, uh -huh. connecting people to, uh, and other small businesses that have um, uh, already established to young entrepreneurs who may want to have a turnkey operation um, business or, uh, working to prevent those downtown businesses from just closing shop when the small business owner is ready to retire. 
And I see that uh, quite frequently in uh, the seven counties that we serve is that um, uh, it's, it's a gap that needs to be filled. So how can we create opportunities through the, our networks to support uh, small businesses wanting to uh, pass their businesses on to someone else? I think that that, where do you work? Where is the, what is uh, the geographical area? Uh, Mattoon, Illinois, okay. uh, based in East Central Illinois. And it covers a large, uh, a large area, so. Okay, all right. So um, I'll, I'll just make a couple comments and then I'll hand it over to the expert over here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from my own personal story, I understand the succession planning thing. Um, and I, I think that's critical. Um, and I'm not sure that we at, at LISC have really worked that into the systems, but you bring up a really mm -hmm. excellent point there. You know, uh, you have young entrepreneurs that want to buy a business that is thriving, we've got to find them and connect them with those businesses in rural communities because they aren't necessarily sitting in the same communities all the time and know each other. So I, I think that's a brilliant question. Now I'm going to hand it over to the <laughs> I don't know if I can answer it, but no, I completely agree. I think succession planning needs to be part of every Main Street revitalization strategy, right? And I think oftentimes it, it does get left out. Um, I think it gets left out oftentimes because it gets complicated, especially in family situations. Um, but having that conversation as part of a revitalization strategy for a downtown area in particular, where you probably know a lot of these owners over many, many years and can have some complex conversations is really important. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I know actually the succession planning is, is part of a lot of the, the, the curriculum within many of the business schools, right? For this very reason. Uh, it, and it's, it's getting left out and it isn't part of, frankly, you know, our, our small business strategy. And it needs to be something that we should be considering as we move forward, just as we're leaning in more on the procurement side, thinking longer term for that next generation of businesses is gonna be incredibly important. So thank you for elevating that. I put it in big letters, <laughs> so I remember it. <laughs> All right, I think that brings us to completion. So Lisa, I just wanna thank you so much. Oh, it's been pleasure. an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Thank you, thank you. I now want to invite our newest member of the, the Rural List team, Julianne Dunn to the stage, and she is going to be talking with us a little bit about the Rural Works cohort. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm not actually the yet the newest member. I'm I'm barely not the US, the newest member, but uh, I am. In, as I mentioned made this joke yesterday. I'm I'm a now a toddler in rural list. Um, and I'm sure also wondering. We didn't plan color coordination. It just happened. Um, but you'll see a lot of red today. <laughs> Um, but again, I'm Julianne Dunn. I am the program officer for workforce development. Been on the phone with a lot of you, and we will continue to be on the phone a lot. But uh, today, I have the absolute pleasure, honor, really, to sit and moderate this panel with some of the some of those that I I am just overwhelmed, honestly. But the work that Rural Works, uh, co our cohort, has done. We just picked a few, but honestly, I could have everyone on here. Um, but uh, first I want to say just like, so Tiffany loves me, uh, the hashtag is rural talks and there's not a competition, but I would love to be the one that had the most hashtags for this session. I'm just saying it's not a competition, but you can make everything a game. So feel free to share on all of the platforms. I learned about a new one called Mastodon. I thought I was young, clearly I'm not. Um, but again, Hashtag rural talks, if you wanna get super elaborate, hashtag rural talks, hashtag workforce development. But uh, I feel like it's enough to ask you to one hashtag. So um, with that, I just uh, the pleasure to introduce three amazing women um, that are representing our cohort of 21 
Rural Works sites. If you're not familiar with Rural Works, it is the brainchild of Justin Archer Birch, who's in the back of the room and will gladly talk to you all about it if you've not already heard the truth about Rural Works. But what we're trying to do is really focus on the innovation that's already happening in our rural communities and elevate and connect and connect with collaboratives, um, work on career pathways, also with um, working on employer co-impact. And in a variety of different ways, this is, 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 uh, is becoming a fact in our community. So I am going to invite the three women on stage as I introduce them. Um, first, Beth Carrico is the Director of Workforce Development at People Inc. in Virginia. She has 12 years experience in nonprofit workforce development and is a certified workforce development professional. As a Director of Workforce Development, Carrico manages eight workforce development programs that serve 16 jurisdictions across the Commonwealth of Virginia. If you just wanna break down how many people that is, it's a lot. Uh, she manages nine program staff and a budget of over 12, 2 million. Beyond delivering grant fund workforce resolutions communities, CARICO focuses on increasing work-based learning opportunities across the agency service point. She has 10 years of experience at uh, People Inc. with previous roles that include senior workforce development specialist and workforce development specialist. She holds a master's degree in human services counseling from Liberty University and resides in Fries, Virginia with her husband and two children. I haven't seen pictures, but I'm gonna ask later. Um, you can say, <laughs> uh, Hillary Boggs is the controller of the Washington County Economic Devi Development Alliance and the Washington County Work Ready Association where she manages all accounting operations of the organization, including the production of financial reports, which is, Awesome. Uh, my maintenance of accounting records and the administration of comprehensive set of controls and budgets designed to mitigate risk, enhance the accuracy of the organization's reported financial results and ensure that the reported results comply with generally accepted accounting principles. And we are so grateful for people who do these sort of things. Uh, Boggs has 16 plus years of advanced statistical, financial analysis, and business development experience. She's an experienced and successful grant writer. She holds a bachelor of science degree from Millsaps College and MBA from Millsaps College L School of Management, where she received numerous awards, including the William Jades Award for Academic Excellence and the Charles Sue Award for Outstanding MBA Student. And finally, but absolutely not the least, <laughs> Patricia Stovell Lane, the Executive Director of Workforce Development Programs at Pastor Corporation, heading operations for the National Farm Works Jobs Program and Senior Community Services Employment Program for New York, Vermont, and Ohio. Employed at Pasto for 20 years and as a program manager, she is responsible for tra providing training uniquely tailored to meet the needs of the multiple stakeholders. And if you were in our pre-session yesterday, you know, Pasto was one of our original initial part members of World, World Works. We're grateful for many of these, but also for embarking on this adventure with us. But um, what I'm going to do, what we're going to do today is each of them are going to present a little bit about their program, and then we have a few questions prepared. And then if you want to keep start ruminating on what questions you want to ask these amazing ladies, uh, you can start now, but let's get started. Beth? All right. Well, thank you all for the opportunity be to be here. Um, I do just have to say, though, I live in Freeze, Virginia. Oh, that was one. Uh, you know, so we you your name on awesome. me. How to pronounce. Um, but People Incorporated is a um, community action agency in Virginia. Um, we, not, okay, <laughs> 1964, um, to provide opportunities for economically disadvantaged people to improve their lives, their families, and their communities. We do serve 16 cities and counties in Virginia as the designated community action agency with over 30 programs in areas like workforce development, um, early childhood education, financial services, housing services, and many more. Our reach does extend further um, with the 32 affordable housing properties that we own and manage um, across Virginia and Northeast Tennessee. We also work across the Southeastern United States, helping build um, businesses open and thrive um, within their communities through our community development activities. Um, as far as our workforce um, programs, we've been in the workforce development space for over 40 years, not me personally. <laughs> um, but, 
People Incorporated as an organization has been doing workforce development programs for quite some time. Um, as Julian said, we do operate um, currently eight different programs, but we have a couple of sub awards as well. So we operate the Workforce the Innovation and Opportunity Act programs, um, adult youth and dislocated worker, as well as um, we are the one stop operator for our region. Um, we are a sub recipient for a Workforce Opportunities for Rural Communities grant, as well as um, we work with our, our Workforce Development Board on a youth build um, project. We have uh, TANF employment programs through our Department of Social Service offices um, and some other state funding, as well as the Rural Works. Um, we are, of course, a, a part of the Rural Works program. We also do Digital Navigator, and we are at FFC um, through Rural LISC. So we love LISC. We are so happy to be here. Um, and that's all I have. I love it. I think there's just one more picture of your beautiful, well, no, there's a lot of pictures. Beautiful <laughs> folks being served Thanks. by all. Um, well, with that, Hillary, would you like to share a little? I'm gonna move backwards. This is my fault. This is nobody else's fault. I put the pictures in the wrong order. All right. Um, I'm Hillary Boggs. I'm the controller at the Washington County Economic Alliance and the Washington County Work Ready Association. And I'm here uh, with Angelica Moten, who's sitting in the back. She's our workforce and special programs coordinator, and she's uh, just wonderful. We have, uh, we're based out of Greenville, Mississippi, and we have three workforce development programs uh, in our organization. We have our Opportunity Youth uh, Workforce Training Program, and it serves individuals aged 16 to 24 who have been disconnected for school or work for an extended period of time. We have our prime age uh, labor force training program, and that's for individuals aged 25 to 54 looking for skill enhancement. And we also have our innovation workforce training program, and that's for individuals that have been touched by the justice system or uh, reentry individuals uh, looking for reentry into the Washington County workforce. Uh, across all of our workforce training programs, we offer support services. We offer transportation support to our workforce trainees in the form of a $500 transportation stipend. We also offer child care support to our workforce trainees, and that's a $200 stipend to help offset the cost of child care while individuals are in workforce training. We also have financial literacy training that we do on a quarterly basis through our partnership with Regents Grant, where individuals that are enrolled in workforce training can uh, learn skills such as budgeting and long-term saving and credit guidance. We have um, affordable housing information sessions with our partnership with Greater Greenville Housing, where individuals learn about how to access safe, affordable housing in our community. And we also offer free expungement clinics to individuals that are a part of our innovation workforce training program through our partnership with the Magnolia Bar Association. And that's where individuals can get together with attorneys from our area and they can learn about opportunities to expunge items from their uh, record. Uh, and so we're, we've worked very hard to cultivate those support services and we have uh, leaned heavily on LISC in developing those and we greatly appreciate them as a thought partner. Uh, the career pathways that we primarily focus on are healthcare. We have a lot of demand for uh, pharmacy technician training and medical administration training. And we also have a lot of uh, demand for commercial driver's license training. And to date, we have trained over 222 individuals and we have about an 85% employment retention rate, which we're very proud of. Uh, we attribute the success of our programs to Angelica. She is a navigator for everyone that enters into our programs from the questions that they have when they mo the, the moment they decide to enter workforce training through testing, uh, just the entire process when they're trying to get a job afterwards. She walks them through this entire process and really helps build trust between she and the workforce trainees. Uh, and we also greatly appreciate our partnership with Rural LISC they have helped us build every one of these programs, have offered technical assistance, and really been an, a, just an instrumental thought partner for ours, and, uh, and have been just a huge piece of our success. Uh, thank you so much. Sometimes when they, like, when you start talking about all the programs, you're just like, whoo, who has time? <laughs> There's so much to do. Uh, um, Patricia, did you want this? I'll click for it. You'll click for me. Okay. I will click for you. Well, could I just stand up? Because I might not be a preacher's kid, but I am a preacher. 
<laughs> I actually operate um, Patricia Snowball Lane. I'm executive director for Pastone Corporation and Workforce Development Programs. I uh, actually have um, um, a degree in human services. I also have my master's degree in social policy and a doctorate in theology. So um, I have to walk and talk at the same time. Want to talk about our mission. Want to talk about Pathstone Corporation because it's bigger than just the programs that I operate. I'd also like to thank Justin and also um, you, Julianne, for inviting me to be a part of the panel. You had me messed up for about a week and I said, oh my gosh, what did I say yes to? Uh, <laughs> um, my new uh, upper echelon, Brenda Soto is a senior vice president for um, direct services and we operate under her division the New York, Vermont, Ohio, which I'm responsible for, Puerto Rico and Maine. And uh, she's doing a great job. She jumped right in, came from Puerto Rico to Rochester, New York. And that is not an easy transition. And Milady Soto, who is my counterpart in Puerto Rico. And we operate multiple legs of programs. Path Stone, and I um, talk about um, our... Our mission isn't up there, but I'll read it. Pathstone builds family and individual self-sufficiency by strengthening farm worker, rural, and urban communities. Pathstone promotes social justice through programs and advocacy. Our action pledge is actually nine points that we live by at Pathstone. So anytime we even accept a grant, we test it with our mission. We test it with our action pledge. That picture there was taken in 1980s. And um, we go wherever farm workers or senior citizens or youth live, work, and play. So that's a part of what we do. We do outreach and recruitment because farm workers, those senior citizens, they don't typically walk in our doors. We operate as a mini one stop for a specialized population. So um, next slide. I'd love to. That's a, I know that's the same picture, but I wanted to show that. If you look at that picture right there, um, the next, sorry, that picture right there was in October 2022. And we were doing the exact same thing. You don't change things that work. And I don't know if you noticed, but that's me. <laughs> that's me. And we were out there. And one of the ways that we capture the audience that we want to work with is we bring them food because guess what? Although they're farm workers, they're low income, they need food. And it opens the, the conversation with us. So we were taking some food out. We were doing some safety trainings. We actually are a part of the Association of Farm Worker Opportunities uh, Programs, and we, which is in 50 states. And we are on that board of directors. So that's Brenda. You might not want to say it. <laughs> <That's Brenda. laughs> And uh, I was taking her around to all of our uh, offices and states uh, for the counties that we serve. And there we had some Jamaican workers and we were talking to them about opportunities they would have if they come on board with Pathstone. So uh, we did share that food that day, but it's the same as the 80s. Here we are in 2022 doing the same thing. We serve the hardest to serve. And I don't know about anybody else. If you've ever walked in a grocery store and you picked up an apple or an onion or bought a turkey or a chicken, whatever it is, and, and um, you uh, looked at that and you decided that uh, it costs too much. There's lives that are out there and they're picking those fruits and they're working with the animals and they're cleaning the stalls, the, the dairy farm workers. I'm not just talking about the growers or the farm owners, the dairy farm workers that get up and they work from sunrise to sunset, which means that an hour before the sun rises, they have to be up and be at the grower site and then they work all day long. I was just sharing yesterday in New York State, 
which was unheard of just about five years ago. They didn't have a right to drinking water. They didn't have the rights that we have as um, the main population. So they're out there in the rural areas and they're out there from sunrise to sunset and about noon, it gets really, really hot. And they didn't have a right to drinking water or porta potty in the field. You know, I, I've, I've marched from um, Albion, New York to Albany, New York and, and stayed on the grounds marching for a worker's rights. Because when you're talking about in that rural area and you're talking about economic development and you're talking about workforce development, when we serve the hardest to serve, first of all, we have to gain their trust. It's not just walking out there and saying, you know, we have this great program and we want to show you something. We have to gain their trust for them to even want to talk to us. That when you talk about being in the rural area, and the actual populations, guess what? There's a hidden population out there. When you bite that apple, somebody may have lost their life because of the pesticides that are spraying. You know, somebody may have um, been out there and they're separated from their children. In the banks, when we talk about the banks, and I wanna give you a picture, even if you close your eyes real quick, I wanna give you a picture of what it's like in, in uh, many of the cities that we serve. And I'll date myself back in Mayberry or um, and Mayberry, or if you look at Hallmark, the little towns, that's what it looks like in the rural areas. Only now the shops are closed. Thank you, the shops are closed. Why? Because the people have made their money and they're moving out. And the farm workers and the senior citizens uh, and the youth don't have the funds. We have so many children working in the fields today that uh, actually because they're in a rural area, there's no mass transportation, there's nobody looking for them. Some of them drop out of school. So our goal is to keep them so that they remain in school, to share the information. We have first generation um, college students and you can keep on with the slides because the picture is gonna tell the story. That's our flow chart, that's how we work. You know, we start with the outreach and recruitment. We do objective and initial assessments because if I don't do initial assessment, guess what? I don't know what your barriers to employment will be. I don't know what your education level will be. So if I don't know that, I can't just put you into a training. Training sites are gonna test our participants and they're not going to accept them. Many times we have to do trainings and you can go to the next slide. We have to do trainings, that's just simplified. But when we do those trainings, those trainings sometimes are, are um, developed with e alongside of it or workplace literacy alongside of it so they take a little bit that's the way we have to work with the individuals that are out there so this is our field office because Pathstone in 1969 started as one field office in for you. Matter of fact, we could have a senior come in and be your receptionist. So it looks like free labor, except for the fact that we have a program that's going to pay them a stipend for doing that. Those are apple trees and we can keep going. Because <laughs> we, we have to drive miles and miles to get to where some of the farms are. So we're going down the road um, from that field office. This is what we're passing by. Sometimes they lose reception. So a lot of times I tell them, please go out in twos. Our large field offices are like three people and they have to do all the work from outreach all the way to placement. We can keep going. 
they were on their way to do this presentation. And the farm owner only gives you that lunch break to present to them and tell them about the pesticide safety, the hearing loss or the back safety. And so those are farm workers uh, that actually we provided that uh, training with, and we did have an opportunity to enroll a few of them into the National Farm Worker Jobs Program and share some more information with them. And um, I, Joy, I don't know where she is. I hope she's in here. But Joy Coates was my project manager. And she can tell you that sometimes I'm on the road all the time, but Joy would call me up and I'm putting out a fire because someone uh, actually had an, uh, a situation with domestic violence and I'm trying to get them into a shelter or a hotel or something. And that's what it's like working out there and we can go on. But we, there's another one of our field offices and uh, we use the sandwich sign. But I think Juanita said yesterday about the yard signs. I'm not a politician, but we're putting out yard signs. We actually, um, th this is what we do. These are some of the farm workers that are in the field. That's some of our staff. They're handing out bags because we have to gain the trust of people. And sometimes when we give out things, like um, you can't see it, but there were over because when you're working in the field, you don't necessarily have the right clothes, you know? And those were people that came and they needed food. There's another slide where we were giving out diapers because they don't have those things, you know? And, and this, this young man works at that farm and uh, we brought him a food box. So they don't need a handout. They just need a hand. And that's what we do. That's who we are. You can go on. Um, that's rural Niagara County. Uh, a lot of people go to Niagara Falls, but they don't know what's behind the scenes. And you can go on. And so um, these are some of our participants. And next we'll go into the cohorts of training that we actually um, specialize in because we make the decision that no, guess what, one stop. They don't need a ninth grade education. We're going to work with them. We're going to add the necessary uh, skills and education so that they can do the CDL, they can do the healthcare, they will pass those state tests and we continue to work with them. And thanks to rule list, we actually were able to add, and you can go on, we were able to add to um, some of the budget so that we could help this individual. That's Roham, he went to truck driving school. He never would have had that opportunity. Matter of fact, we went to the growers and we were standing in the parking lot until they ran us out. And that is a woman, um, Christina, she's non-traditional in that job, but she's driving that truck. And I uh, asked my staff last week, both of them passed the CDL test, but uh, they both had to ride share to get to the training because it's not in that rural area. It's over in Buffalo, New York. It's not in Albion. It's not in Lockport. You can go on. And then this is a group, um, a group training with forklift. And these guys were so excited because they got a certification in forklift. They were so excited. And we already had jobs waiting for them. So, but this was on a Saturday. So staff works non-traditional hours to make this things happen. You can go on. And so um, th this young man uh, actually got a job. He's making $25 an hour. You come from the field to make it $25 an hour. And I want to share, when you talk about those little, um, those places in the, uh, in the uh, rural area, in the, the main street, we, we are right next to the Erie Canal. And that Erie Canal comes from our Lockport office. It goes all the way through Williamson. I mean, literally we could jump in the water, but we won't. Uh, but um, I can tell you that there's individuals that have like their little mom and pop restaurant out of their trunk. And they go to where the farms are because they don't get a lunch break. They don't have a car. They get taken to those farms in a truck. And so they to be able to provide the service so that they could, open a restaurant or have a real food truck. You know, I mean, those are opportunities that we would like to and want to um, provide for them. These two young ladies uh, got their certification in healthcare. I mean, like 
And then we have, um, lastly but not least, we have this individual. They hired him at Better Bakers, and he, he he's working in a bakery, and he's working on a CNC machine. Can you imagine that from a fifth grade education and going in and having math taught to him and him tutored and 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 the training site, uh, YamTap, Young Adults Training uh, and Employment Program actually did training and they helped him with understanding what the measurements and all those things are. And he got a job. That's what this is all about. And, um, and these are two of our young college students, they're first generation college students. So we touch every aspect. We have the reentry program. We know we, we actually have uh, the youth participating and that have had a brush with the law. These are ways that we give presentations. We go where they live, work, and play, and that is all for me. <laughs> you can see how it's uh, really hard to be on these Zoom calls and just be really, like scheduled an hour. And then after talking to each of them, it's like four hours later, you're like, I don't even feel like I've hit the tip of the iceberg with what y'all are doing. Um, so I, just a quick question, like um, we talked about this quite a bit, like what are some of the challenges? We talked a lot about this, but what are some of the challenges and priorities that you're facing in your work as you know, we're coming, you know, th third year of the pandemic and also a lot of uh, trans like a, par a movement around the country, but like what are the priorities and challenges y'all are facing? I will start with Patricia. <laughs> One of them was uh, definitely the equipment. They may not, and once we bought the equipment, Rule List <laughs> gave us the funds. And so we thought, oh my gosh, this will be great. We partnered with um, a Head Start program and we got some tablets and got them out to the parents only to find out what good is it without internet? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are they going to do with it? Uh, so uh, we tried to get them into places, but a lot of places wouldn't let them in. That's still a challenge. And some people are not going to work because they think that they get more benefits um, from being out of work on social services. They get more food stamps. They get, at least they get Medicaid. But a lot of the workers that we work with, farm workers, they don't get it. They don't get it because they don't qualify because we have to go through 17 points of validation just to get them in our program. And so when you're talking about uh, contacting a person and then you start the intake process and the eligibility for work history that has to qualify them for WIOA program, the National Farm Worker Jobs Program, they actually... Um, sometimes won't even tell or won't access DSS. It's too much red tape, so they give up. And so they'll go and clean houses and do all those things behind the scenes. So they're not in the census, because guess what? No one is really looking for them. Yeah. Uh, well, for us in Washington County, our primary challenges are transportation and childcare. Those are our biggest barriers to workforce training. Uh, we do not have a public transportation system, and statistics in our area show that there is one car for every two low-income households. So for us, coming up with innovative solutions to address the training, our training provider is uh, about 20 minutes away from us. So getting people to workforce training and back is something that we continually grapple with and also finding access to those private funding streams that allow us to, uh, to support the transportation cost in our uh, programs is, is a big challenge for us as well. Our priorities are to continue to develop innovative workforce training programs and to add on to our support services. We're currently looking at whether to address food insecurities in our support services. Uh, Washington County is considered a food swamp, so most individuals in our area lack access to fresh fruits and vegetables, and they rely uh, on non-nutritious options like fast food restaurants for their food. And so we've had a lot of workforce trainees that have lifted this up to Angelica, so that's something that we're currently looking at. And we also are working with another uh, community partner to potentially add substance abuse and mental health counseling mm -hmm. to our support services. We really want to address the person as a whole for each individual workforce trainee that comes to us that is looking to uh, enhance their skills so that they can find livable wage employment in our area. So we of course have all the same challenges. 
Um, but I think I'll focus a little bit on how we're prioritizing our work to overcome those challenges. So of course, building out those career pathways through our training opportunities is one of our highest priorities. And you can give me my brownie points for that later. Um, <laughs> the, later. The, um, the Rural Works cohort came along at a time that as a region, we were um, going through a strate strategic planning process. And we were talking about how we were going to prioritize um, training and access to training and really try to um, figure out that better way. You know, we were all saying there has to be a better way to do this. You know, the training's too far away. People can't get to it. It starts in three months. They need training now. Our business needs people. None of these things were lining up. So um, as a region, you know, we're, we're just having those conversations. There has to be a better way to access the training. So we're looking at um, those non-traditional providers. We're looking at bringing in new opportunities and not just solely relying on our post-secondary providers in our area. Yes, we're still utilizing them, but a lot of what they were providing was that two-year program, you know, they're, and then you can enter the career pathway, you know, maybe mid-level. Well, we all have financial obligations and we need something that's going to be a quick fix and get us into that career pathway, maybe at the entry level, because we're seeing entry level wages increase fairly rapidly and provide that sustainable, um, or, or at least starting out sustainable wage for that family. Um, and how can someone enter and progress along that career pathway or as we actually came to refer to them, a career lattice in a different way, because we know there's multiple points of entry and multiple points of exit and multiple ways that you can move up this lattice um, to reach what your designated goal may be. Um, and then also just moving our customers and our job seekers through this process. Um, as we heard a little bit earlier, some of the things like those digital um, skills and foundational skills that our customers really need, those um, academic skills, those are things that um, I think traditionally, at least for us, have been um, prerequisites almost, things that we required folks to do before training started. Um, and we were, were really prioritizing, trying to find how those things fit into these non-traditional training opportunities to fast track being able to get into that training, gain that skill and get into employment. So you are meeting your family's you know, financial needs and your individual needs and being able to thrive. Right, that's such an important word. <laughs> I also yeah. really love the career lattice. I've been calling it those like monkey bars that are like round because it's not always up. It's not always the like right. you just kind of sometimes you're on the outside, sometimes you're on the but I like lattice better. It sounds more professional. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> this is so fantastic. What you kind of touched, you already sort of touched on this, but like when you're looking towards the future, I mean, there, it's hard to do it at this point. We now know like we can't count on anything really. It's hard to plan five years ahead advance, like not even one year in advance, but like, what are the one, like, so what's the one challenge? You mentioned a few of them when you're just talking about it. Like, what's the one challenge you're definitely going to be working on the most because you see a long-term impact on it. I'm going to start with Hillary this time. Well, so for us, um, the, the thing that we're really working on is making sure that in the future and going forward, our workforce remains innovative and skilled. Uh, there's some leading economic forums that indicate that uh, there will be a greater a reliance on technology across all industries going forward, and that 50% of employees can expect to be reskilled at some point because of this. And then there's also a lot of um, information where it's some of the most in demand jobs that we have right now might not even exist in 10 years from now. So we, you know, how do you plan for something like that? And so what we're doing is we're working with our industry leaders in our community, our educational institutions and our community partners to make sure that our workforce uh, is properly prepared for this greater reliance on technology and that they have the skills uh, in hand so that they can remain competitive today and tomorrow. I think 
I mean, that was excellent because one of the things that we've been able to do in working with um, the Alliance, Rework America Alliance, is start with our staff because it really does start with training our staff to change their mindset. Um, and once they change their mindset, they're going to partner with all the individuals in a different way. Um, empower them to have the knowledge and experience to go in and meet with the area um, training providers and employers and, and remove some of those biases that they've always had about the populations that we serve. Um, there is no such thing as at 55 a person just retires or at 62 a person just retires. These individuals need to be trained and they need to be trained in a different way, not the, the traditional way for the 19 year old, but how do we actually implement or create a training that's gonna be viable for them? And if English is not their first language, what do you do to get them properly trained? I know um, Senator Schumer of New York introduced this uh, new uh, chip uh, factory. It's a billion dollar industry that's coming up right there in Wayne County. So how do we get access to some of those jobs? How do we actually get our um, workforce prepared to be a part of that initiative? Because we're right there in the heart of it. And I don't want them to just come in and do the cleaning jobs. I understand that transportation is a problem because um, historically they're saying they don't need transportation. People have cars. People with money have cars. People with money pay their tickets, you know? And here we have individuals that live and work in those rural areas that don't have transportation. We, we actually connected a ride share, but when the person that has a car doesn't go to work, no one goes to work, you know? So we still have a greater problem. How do we get wheels to work back in um, the process? So it's even little things like that. And so we've been talking about different things that we want to implement. And we've been going out and going after the training providers and having focus groups. Um, I, I love um, our first focus group that we had with We Work America. I kept saying, Joy, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And um, she got an opportunity to see that it is a little bit different. They think they have all the answers and that it's that way, but they, they don't include this other population that we serve. And so we've been working very hard to let them see and help include them, trying to enroll them in that, that mainstream one-stop system so that you can see the multiple barriers that we have, you know, regardless of whether you say, no, thanks, I sit on that board and they have the same opportunities as anybody else. So I want to see them enroll. So I kind of touched on um, how we were working on um, those integrated training models, but I would definitely say that is a primary focus moving forward. Um, we have some specific sectors that we are um, prioritizing as a region, of course, because of our industry. You know, these are the, the primary drivers for us. So um, we are we have started um, with this process. We do have a few providers that we are working with, and it's really an integrated service delivery model where um, individuals are accessing um, a classroom or digital platform um, with instruction to begin learning a skill. And then we're incorporating our businesses and um, getting them on board through partnerships that provide a work-based component where once an individual gets um, the access to, or, you know, they, they master, so to speak, that skill in the classroom, they transition to a work site where they are practicing that skill hands-on, um, you know, getting the proficiency, hopefully, that our business community needs. So when that person completes their training, they're able to transition straight into employment. Um, we have a partnership with a manufacturing skill center. Um, and one of our businesses has been just foundational in developing that, um, financially supporting it, um, and providing that work-based component for those individuals. And um, those folks are working towards a manufacturing production technician certification through the manufacturing skills standard standard center um 
Then we are addressing our skilled trades with the Home Builders Institute Pre-Apprenticeship Certification Training. I'm used to just the acronyms, but I figured I should probably say what they stand for, but I'm getting tongue-tied and trying to do so. Um, but with that HBI Pact, we are um, doing a construction core training um, for our skilled trades, and then folks can specialize um, from there. And in our healthcare industry, we have another business. We've been so fortunate. We really have some great business buy-in in, in our area. Um, but we have a business that has, um, it was a like a home health group home type of mm -hmm. business, and they developed a healthcare academy in our region. And it's amazing because we can get that um, initial entry level training for folks. Right now it is CNA. Um, they are getting the hands on, they're practicing their skills. They are actually working in um, a home or in a facility on mastering those skills to get their certifications there. But we're working on building out the healthcare program to also have an entry level pathway for peer recovery specialists. And we're working with um, an actual recovery um, organization in our region. So someone who does provide like an inpatient recovery um, treatment program. And um, from there, hopefully we'll build out the career pathway to include uh, community health workers and substance abuse mm. counselors. And so those are the points where like our traditional post-secondary providers will be um, brought in. What we are still... I mean, there's so much, right? There's so much to address, especially with the populations that we work with, but we really are working on integrating those foundational skills, the um, socio-emotional skills that folks need, the academic skills, just their general workplace readiness. Um, financial literacy mm. is, is a huge one, you know? oh, we have to have a paycheck for two weeks, you know, and it has to meet all our needs for the whole two weeks. Um, and then the digital literacy and being able to connect because a lot of these opportunities do involve connecting to training um, in that digital platform, even though it is instruction based, you know, they are virtually connecting to a lot of these opportunities. So figuring out how to integrate those things and not necessarily just make it that prerequisite checklist. One, so that we're really maximizing the benefit that folks are getting from these foundational skills that we're trying to provide. And we're not just, you know, breezing through them to check a box to get them into their training program. But we really need to make sure that it is an integrated model where they're, um, the foundational skills are just as important mm -hmm. as the technical skills that individuals are learning. Um, and so that that's a big priority for us, you know, we all know that people want, and I would say, you know, generational, that Gen Z, they want that instant gratification, but it is just people in general. You know, we all have just gotten to the point where we have what we need at our fingertips. Most of us in this room, right? And like, if you're going to start something, you want something out of it. You know, we want to feel like we have an achievement very early on. Um, so whether that includes incentivizing um, participation, but you know we want that fast training program, we want that fast job, we want the solution to our problem. We know along the way we need to obtain X, Y, and Z. And so how do we make sure that feeling of um, accomplishment is there and um, make sure that folks stay engaged, but still provide the meaningful um, services with those foundational skills and the technical skills and really integrating that model is, is what I would say we're working towards. We're really intentional about trying to make that happen. Yeah. And I love that all three, I mean, all three of you and every rural works folks that I've talked to, it's, it's like the concept of workforce development is not just about the training. It's about the human. It's about the whole person. It's, it's what's keeping them from being able to get to work. It's what, you know, what kind of mental health challenge are they dealing with? What kind of, you know, um, support? So, I mean, I, I love that as a theme that's already, if it's not evident to everyone in the room, I've just articulated it for you. But um, the last question I want to ask before we open it up to the brilliant minds in the room as well, um, when we were preparing for this call, one of the things that we kind of started to talk about 
um, was the role of the systems that we're working with and the, the funding availability to address some of these challenges. And in fact, I feel like Lisa and Kate also talked about this a little more. So maybe this is a new theme, but you know, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on the roles of the systems that we work in and the funding available to support those. Um, and this time I'm gonna start with Beth. Oh goodness, there's so many things. <laughs> and I will try not to get on any soapboxes here, but I really, really enjoyed hearing um, from uh, Lisa this morning, particularly when she was talking about um, those rural communities and how we're measuring success. You know, we, we may not achieve those outcomes as quickly and our funders really need to, to realize that. I feel like so many times um, the work that we do is numbers, meeting the numbers, getting the outcomes and that that's important. You know, it's important, we have to have accountability, you know, that's accountability for the work that we do. But, but is there another way that we can measure success for a client? Um, you know, is it just that, you know, if they obtain employment and retain it for two quarters, four quarters, whatever it might be, is that the only measure of success? Because for me, and this is, um, a little bit personal to me just from being in the system for worse so long and seeing people in my community that I worked with 10 years ago and seeing where they stand now. And then, you know, from the programmatic level right now, getting the data and looking at who didn't meet fourth quarter employment and thinking, what happened? Because, you know, that person was really on track when, when we kind of finished up services. So, so what happened in between closure and now? And there's really no room to tell that story. So maybe for, for the, the drug addict, you know, who's been clean and who's gone through their training and who got their credential and got employment, maybe they relapsed. But maybe it took that relapse for them to realize, okay, you know, I had all the things going on, you know, I was staying busy and I was staying clean and I did it and I had a minute to breathe and what did I do? I turned back to my habits. And it might take that for them to realize they didn't get the support they needed that first go around. They didn't seek the counseling. They didn't seek the support groups. So they did relapse and they did lose their job and they didn't go straight back to employment. It was an eye opener for them. Mm -hmm. And they realized, hey, guess what? I gotta do this and I gotta do it right this time. I have to have the supports. I have to get the counseling. I have to go to the meetings and it's clean. You know, I have to be clean of everything, drugs, alcohol, and, and the like. So I, I physically see the stories from people that I've worked with over my career. And I physically see their successes, but it may not be the success that the funder's looking for. But where's, where's the medium? You know, where, where's the middle ground? How can we say, hey, this person is doing it. You know, they are successful, absolutely 100%. And this is a real story, you know, and I, I see this person in my community and they're doing it. But, you know, on paper, are they a success? No. Are they a success? Absolutely, one hundred percent. They're a success. Yeah, so, yeah, we just. I mean, the the flexible funding that you know, it's great. It's great because the flex. I feel like the flexible funding, the flexible funders, get that everything doesn't fit into that perfect box. Um, but not all of the funders are very flexible. <laughs> Um, and, and Patricia touched earlier on um, my other thing would just be staffing. Um, I mean, what can you say? You know, who here has high turn turnover in their workforce programs? Right, right. exactly. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, people. Is anybody else experiencing high turnover? Yeah. Is it just me? No. no. Okay, no. okay. No. Just making sure, you know, if I needed to go back and take a look in the mirror. Uh, but, you know, we have to invest in our, our, our people, mm -hmm. our staff. If they're leaving at a high rate, what, at what point do you look in the mirror? At what point do we say, it is us? There's too much, you know, they're burnout. Mm -hmm. 
how can we have like, you know, we expect somebody to be the perfect data person and we expect them to be the most empathetic and caring and compassionate case manager that you've ever seen. And those are two very different skill sets that typically go along with very different personalities and very different people. It's a hard match to find someone to do both. So, you know, how can we play on the strengths of the people that we have and not overburden and not burn our staff out and not scare them away within their first six months? Because, you know, there's so much to learn. Um, I'm still learning. You know, I don't, I tell my staff, I don't have all the answers, but we would know where to find them and we'll look for them and we'll get it. You know, because it's just ever changing. Um, and I don't want to cut you off. I'm sorry. Are, no, I mean, this I'm is done. like Thank you're you. talking to the right crowd, right? Like, <laughs> if you're not online, you can't see, but this room is like, uh huh, uh huh, yeah. for all three of them. And I, I do, I, I wish I could give, we're out of time. It's okay. actually to even for, for Patricia and, and Hillary too, but um, I do want to give a chance. We are running like a little bit over, but if there is a question in the audience that you want to ask this group, um, that's great, but also the three of them are here all day today and tomorrow, and they are incredibly friendly. Uh, and so, and we have a reception tonight where I imagine if you want to huddle in a quarter with them and learn more, that they would be more than willing to find time to talk to you. But if we have a question, that's cool. But if not, I would like to. Okay, I'm gonna. I know there are questions, but I would like to thank you all three. You are amazing women working in a hard job that you are creating amazing outcomes. And I really appreciate your time here. Yeah, thank you. And another. In my heart, it's like a, always a standing ovation when I hear you guys doing your work. But <laughs> we are going to take a little break um, and come back at um, 11, if I'm correct, and uh, hear from some exciting news from Lee Jones. So um, thank you all very much.